then we are, I am excited to kick off our discussion today uh, with, um, that is on the topic of purposeful living, but I wouldn't have been able to put this together without Ben Chernow of Seniors Helping Seniors. So uh, Ben, hey, there you are. Um, hey, Steve. Ben, really charged up about today's discussion, and uh, and we're going to meet um, Jim, Jim Lanning in a moment, but before we do, uh, I want to thank you for introducing me to Jim to have him on today, but the, the topic today of purposeful living, um, really speaks to the organization that you're a part of. It's called Seniors Helping Seniors. Tell us a little bit about yourself and about your organization, and then we'll, we'll bring Jim on. Yeah. Thanks for the intro. I'm very excited to be here as well. Um, so as he said, my name is Ben Chernow. Um, I am with Seniors Helping Seniors. So a little bit about my background. I used to be an attorney. I went to Vanderbilt University down in Nashville. actually did a dual degree program. So I was there for four years, left with a law degree and an MBA. After school, I did um, commercial litigation, which really is just a fancy way of saying that I help companies sue each other. <laughs> and I... Did not enjoy that very much. I thought it was kind of just unnecessary and purposeless and not accomplishing anything. So I wanted to pivot to something that I thought was more meaningful and that helped people. And that's kind of the short story of how I wound up with Seniors Helping Seniors. So we are a home care agency. So we provide non-medical care and support so we can do things like take people to the doctor, drive them around on errands, help around the house with housekeeping, meal prep. Yeah, there's our website. And we really emphasize the kind of social aspects of care. So our caregivers are people who have really strong social skills, who enjoy, um, you know, interacting with clients and yeah, who, who enjoy building relationships with clients. So a lot of our people are retirees who are looking to kind of be productive and do something that really helps other people. And I think it ties in really well to your theme here of purposeful living. And I know Jim pretty well. He, he's amazing. And I'm excited to do this with him today. Man, me too. And uh, so let's let's bring Jim on. And um, and I'm I'm super excited for all of you to meet Jim. I had a brief conversation with him a few months ago, setting this up. And I was like, man, I, uh, th number one, thanks Ben for the intro, because I think Jim, uh, you're going to really prompt us all to sort of think a little bit differently about this world of caregiving and living with purpose and what we do with our time and how we support each other. So uh, thanks for coming on today. And uh, Jim, let's, uh, you know, you can start wherever you like, but but tell us a little bit about your journey that we call life, because it really is pretty interesting to me, at least. Well, thank you for uh, inviting me to share some time with you this morning. I, I appreciate it very much. And uh, thank you, Ben, for the, facilitating this introduction. Um, and before I talk really about me, um, I, I want to say how much I've appreciated getting to know Ben and how much I enjoy working with uh, seniors helping seniors because um, that's that's a big part of what I'm doing right now and I'm I'm very gratified to be a, a part of the organization and, and have this opportunity. Um, my caregiving actually started when I was 11 years old. Um, I went to school with uh, Two, two young guys, Timmy Howe and Teddy Howe, whose father, Carl Howe, started the Sharon Nursing Home, which became the Brook Grove Foundation in Olney, Maryland. And back then, I can talk, Carl's past now, so I don't, I'm not going to get him in trouble by saying he hired me at 11 years old. Um, I think you were supposed to be 14, but we both went to, we, we all attended a private school together um, in Spencerville. And the tuition uh, for private school is is fairly significant. So he would hire some of the folks to do dishes on Sundays and from four to seven uh, in the evenings, 
not to stay up too late, so forth. But um, so I got my caregiving there by working in that nursing home, and I got to know some of the residents. And one in particular was a blind lady named Mrs. Brown, and I would read letters to her. And then l later on, one of my brothers started working there with me, and he would read letters to her and help her, and and she would reach in her pocket and give uh, me a big coin, which was a nickel, and my little brother a dime, since he was little, for uh, reading and doing things. To, we always got a kick out of that. But uh, my caregiving started there, and I really developed a passion for helping the, the elderly and learning from them, which is kind of fortunate because now I'm surrounded uh, with caregiving, not only with Ben and seniors helping sen seniors, but um, as part of my, my family. But before I go there, I'll tell you the, the kind of sandwich, the in-between part of the caregiving. Um, my dad was a pilot, and he taught all of us to fly, and I taught all my kids to fly. So we're a, a flying family. Monday, I took a couple trips down to West Palm and back, and tomorrow I'll be flying a Falcon 2000 to West Palm and to uh, Peach Street to Kalb. And maybe picking up a dog in Norfolk and taking the dog to Vero, I, it's just it's 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 a fun part of uh of it's a it's a fun diversion to caregiving although i will say towards the end of the life of the guy that i used to fly with um there was a lot of caregiving uh with him i mean he got to the point where late in his 80s we'd have to help him in and out of the plane and in and out of the restrooms and um, you know, and, and even now with the, with some of the families that I'm flying, I'm taking walkers and crutches and I'm having to be very thoughtful about how we load things, how things are carried. So I'm in a situation where my life is surrounded with caregiving. I, I mentioned my dad flying. He actually flew up until 93. He, he delivered uh, an airplane, open cockpit, 1929, uh, Great Lakes down to Alabama. And um, the year before he passed, he passed in April this year. Now, now not to interrupt you, but uh, Jim, I'm I'm curious. Like, uh, were all of you is is flying a hobby for your family or a profession? And um... profession, it's it, it's a profession, and and a lot of people don't realize it. But like my brother's a, a United Airlines captain. He called this morning on his way from Dulles to San Diego, and. Yesterday he was on a trip to San Juan, to, but he he gives care as well when he's not flying. Um, I'll fly once or twice a week, and that helps support my habit of humanitarian aid and caregiving. Um, throughout my flying career, uh, my other brother, I'll put in a plug for him. If anybody listening is near Frederick, Maryland, he owns the big flight operation there. I think they have a uh, I think 11 helicopters now and 68 aircraft between Frederick and Martin State Airport. Um, they teach flying and, and helicopters and fixed wing. And wow. Yeah, it's a, it's a huge part of our, it's not just a hobby. No, it's, it's okay. part of and, our And now, now, now it sounds like, I mean, you're sort of, you was, were you a commercial pilot like with a large carrier uh, no. in your career? Okay. No. What so, but uh, but was your when you were working full time? What was your uh, profession after? When I was working full time, it was always in humanitarian aid and with flying as a support mechanism. I I, I kind of like Ben started out in some careers that you know I, I just wasn't getting any satisfaction out of it, um, and it was in development and commercial real estate and all kind of different things. And I just wasn't feeling fulfilled. So I decided that I would give about a year back to the church through the Adventist church. They have a, a humanitarian arm of the Adventist church called ADRA. It stands for the Adventist Development and Relief Agency. Mm-hmm. And their motto is to kind of serve humanity uh, so that all may live 
and as God intended with uh, um, intention, I guess, and with um, compassion and, and uh, I didn't memorize it, but it's, it just resonated with me. And that year that I decided to give back, it was about uh, 1992. I remember talking it over with my wife and it was a, it was about a hundred thousand dollar year pay cut from doing what I was doing and flying. Cause I've always flown along with that. And that year turned into 15 years, man. And then I said, uh, it, you know what, I've got to start putting something in a 401k. And I told Adra, I'm going to go ahead and start flying full time. Uh, but corporately it was my passion. I didn't like, flying like my brother at United, going from city to city like a bus. I, I've i always enjoyed flying for different families and, and had the opportunity to fly all sorts of people that you'd recognize and, and you know, the women's soccer team from San Diego to a game in Philly and movie stars and different ones. And it, it's been oh, kind cool. of fun. And Man, they, what, a, what an interesting life. It, yeah, and it's yeah. I, I'm glad you referenced Ben because it really we really are talking about purposeful living yes and you know a lot of this is is when we transition from our working job to whatever we call that i don't like the word retirement i like graduate but the yeah, uh, graduating but that's that that seems to be one of the the markers where we a lot of times we get confused and it's sort of like what am i going to do but you two are both examples of people that said no the time to do it is right now. Now, I've got a, uh, this is great, Jim, you're going to love it. Linnell Smith is on this discussion and she says, so fun to hear and see Jim. I went to school with his wife and we all went to the same high school. And now I've worked at Brook Grove for over 31 years. I didn't realize Jim got his start at Brook Grove. And uh, um, uh, so that that's pretty cool. Um, the, uh, uh, and, and 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 so go, you know, I know we're jumping all over the place, but that's what I love okay. about these discussions. So you got, you, but you got your start there, you, you know, reading to somebody at 11 years old, and it sort of led you down a path of helping other people, really. It did. In fact, if she's referencing uh, going to school with my wife, Jane, uh, when when I worked there at Sharon long enough, and then they invited me to go over to Brook Grove, and uh, I know it was Millie and Minerva, the, the two beautiful, beautiful ladies from a community near where I grew up in Zion, uh, taught me to cook. And Janie, my wife, was actually my sous chef and did the dishes and pots and pans for me. And so we worked together. I was her boss. At that point, I was 16 and she was 14. So I put in a number of years there um, throughout my career. And then I did some private duty nursing uh, later at Brook Road. So I, I really do have quite a quite a long history with the, the Howe family. And ironically, a year ago, when mom and dad went into Williamsport rehab after a, a hospital stay, um, I picked up a pamphlet. And it was seniors helping seniors. So it was on the way home from Williamsport, which is part of the Brook Grove Foundation, where my mom is now. I was there yesterday and going to be there Friday for a, a meeting that I called Ben and uh, left a message and said, I'm not sure if I'm going to hire you or work with you or both. <laughs> I, I just didn't know. But I've got... We helped give care to a lady in Leisure World named Ingrid, who just joined our church. Um, she's 95. She was buried alive in Germany in Hanover when the British were bombing them. And, and, and Holy cow. She was, uh, yeah, actually at a, a Hansel and Gretel play, and the air raids went off, and she was the only survivor and out of the whole, out of everybody. And uh, she was adopted, and then her adopting father went blind from the gas that was used in that bombing hmm. she's a, she's 95 and she's in le leisure world so we helped give care to her and we met her through Janie teaching her to play the piano 
My mom is 94. She's in Williamsport. I've got two deaf grandbabies uh, that were both born deaf, and now they're four and seven. So we've become part of that ASL caregiving, and now grandpa and grandma all you know know ASL and are part of that community. And Janie's mom is 90. Janie also has a uh, mentally challenged 60-year-old brother who were the guardianship and the trustees for. And she has a schizophrenic brother who that were the guardians for and, and helped for. So our lives are filled with care. And I'm reading about it and studying about it. And that's why I said, you know what? I, I'm I'm learning enough to get pretty good at this. I ought to I ought to help others because it's exposed me to the fact that there's so many people through an organization like Seniors Helping Seniors, you can you can just easily help them with almost, you know, well, it's just become second nature to you. And they're so appreciative. I mean, well, little things like light bulbs changing and taking things up and down the stairs and packing Christmas things and putting them in the way and putting up just the smallest little details, bringing people food, getting their groceries. They it's, it's life changing for them. And it's a yeah. way you can give a tithe kind of on your time. Uh, Jim, I, you, you've given me so much. I'm, my head's about to explode. Uh, the, I've got a few things, questions and sure. comments that I want to follow up on. First, you you've had quite a little love story here that started at a nursing home. Uh, if in case folks didn't didn't pick up on it, that he met his wife in as a teenager in the nursing home working in the kitchen. How many years have you been married? Uh, Forty seven. Wow. Uh, congrats. You know, I see a heart floating up in the back. Yeah. <laughs> yep, yep, yeah. No, no. My, my heart's beating, too. It's a, uh, so congrats on that. And then the the other thing that I'm just blown away and I want to commend you on, but I but I but I'd like to you to share some of your thoughts on this is is that you, you know you sort of just rattled off uh, probably over a half dozen people in your circle, whether they're members of your church or blood re relatives that need help with due to disability, healthcare, uh, mental health conditions that you're involved actively as a caregiver and you sort of wreck it. I think what you were talking about earlier is how, you know, you are fortunate to be in this family that um, has a culture of caring and taking care of each other. And I, I imagine what you're seeing when you you go on assignments with senior help, helping seniors is something that we talk about on a regular basis here, and that's solo aging and the amount of people that are out there that that don't necessarily have somebody nearby to take care of them, or maybe don't they maybe they've outlived their whole family, and how easy and fulfilling it is to um to make this a part of your life. Um, it, it, am I correct in that? Yeah. in that overview. Yeah, no, you are. You're, you're you're spot on. It's just it's it's a very gratifying thing to do um, to to help people, and I think it's uh, ironically it it seems to help me more than anybody. I mean, I get as much uh, satisfaction and gratification from helping others and seeing the reaction that it creates to, in their lives. Um, it's it's really, um, I find it extremely rewarding. I will I also it's say what we are challenged to to do um, as as humans, you know, to to love each other and care for one another. A lot, a lot of the work Jim does is it's called respite care, which means really he's coming in and in these situations he's providing care to the husband for a couple hours so that the wife can have a reprieve from her caregiving responsibilities and have some time to herself. And I think it's kind of a double whammy because Jim is interacting with, with the husband and providing care and all the things that he's talking about. And then I'm hearing back from the wife about just how amazing it is to have a couple hours to herself throughout the week. Um, man, this is great. Well, one, one thing that I'm dropping into chat 
is uh, is your contact info, Ben, so that if there's other folks out there that are inspired by what Jim is sharing, you, you know, or if you're sort of thinking, wow, this is kind of a cool concept uh, where I could have somebody like Jim come in, you know, help my mom, you, you know, uh, reach out to Ben. That, that, that's um, uh, a, a great, gr great way to do that. Great um, resource. Yeah. yeah, please do reach out. We're always looking for good people and we have plenty of great people if you're looking for help. Yeah. But um, so, uh, Jim, you know, I, I loved how you shared the um, the 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 family that you're the individual that you were taking care of that was um, involved in the Holocaust. And and uh, but have you had other sort of experiences in in your, you know, as as a caregiver to people other than your family um, that that you'd like to share anecdotally? Well, I mean, I've I've always gravitated towards caregiving uh, as part of my life. Um, I mentioned the Brook Grove Nursing Home, and and actually, I, I met Jane before that. I met her originally when uh, she was ten years old, and I was eleven on a on a camping trip that was uh, hosted by our church, um, and she was with a different church, and our paths just kept intertwining and. Uh, she was my best friend, but uh, we never, I never even envisioned dating her until after um, I graduated from, from high school. And she was in that same carpool with the Timmy and Teddy Howe of uh, Brook Road. So, yeah, it's very interconnected and uh, surprisingly how intertwined it was. But early in our marriage, um, just because we were young and didn't have a lot of money and my flying career was just getting started back then, for, uh, and, and just to put it in perspective, that was uh, in the 70s, and pilots were trying to build time so that you could get commercially rated and airline transport rated, which I am and all that. But I would literally fly for 8 or $10 an hour to make milk and egg money. And so she started doing night duty, night shift work, um, caring for an elderly lady that lived not too far from us. Man, and I started doing some night shift work now and then. So I would I would uh, lay on the floor on a sleeping bag and help this guy and get up and and you know do his. He had Parkinson's, and uh, back then it was eight dollars an hour. So I'd get a check every morning for sixty four dollars, and then go to school because I was still in in my first year of college and just so we were just getting started, and that was a it's always been part of my my go-to thing of uh i'm gonna fly and care give and it's just been one of the one of the tools in the in the toolbox so to speak man one of the most beautiful and unique stories and i'm so glad that we're featuring you because i think it can give folks just a different perspective of you know of who can be taking care of our loved ones and what we can do to, to live a more purposeful life. Now I got a few questions for, uh, for Ben here on um, seniors helping seniors and Kelly asks, um, do your clients require personal care, any pushback on the gender of the caregivers that you deploy? Um, maybe a little bit of the inside baseball on that, uh, uh, Ben, in terms of, you know, when you get a call from somebody that needs care and figuring out, you know, do, do I send Jim over or is it somebody else? Yeah, it's a good question. So not all of our clients require personal care. I would say most of them don't. Some of them do. It looks a little bit different when they do. We have a nurse on staff when personal care is involved. I kind of take a backseat and she kind of runs the show a little bit. Um, in terms of pushback on gender, more than you would think, although in my experience, um, typically it's the family who, who pushes back and says mom wants a woman, not a, a man. Um, and, you know, we, we always try to accommodate preferences. But sometimes um, after meeting the client, I'll say, you know what, we have a man to work with your mom who it, it's going to be a good match. And usually we're right about that. Um, so we do try to accommodate, but we also try to just make a good match too. 
Okay. And then Stephen is asking what areas you serve in, in Maryland, but I'm also pulling up um, the Seniors yeah, Helping Seniors website here where you can see there's uh, like Ben, your specific office, uh, what, what region do you serve? Yeah. So we're based in Bethesda. We do Montgomery County. We're that little dot on top of that one right there, I think. Um, yeah. And then there's another office in the Annapolis area and then two immediately south of us, one Alexandria, one Fairfax. Okay. And then, but you can see there, uh, I could probably reset this and there would be you know, uh, yeah. offices all over the country. Um, so uh, seniorshelpingseniors.com, also just reaching out to Ben directly to mm -hmm. get more information about it as well. Um, and uh, okay, uh, Cheryl is asking, how can you be reached? I'm going to drop uh, Ben's contact for everyone. And, you know, <laughs> since, as we know, uh, Jim... I'm not going to put your email in there, folks. If you want to get in touch with Jim, talk to Ben. Uh, and uh, uh, we 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 don't want um, uh, too too much too much there. Um, okay, I, I don't really. Jim I want to I, I want to just say you're welcome to share my my email and my number. And if anybody was is interested in caregiving, obviously go through through Ben. But if you wanted to follow up because you're a friend of James or in the flying world or any other thing, that's oh, okay. I don't Here. mind at all. Okay, cool. Yeah, I'll I'll drop your email in there, um, Jim, because uh, I think you we've already seen that you have a fan club uh, uh, <laughs> uh, here. And the other thing is, I just glanced at the the clock. Uh, it's twelve thirty, and and uh, and Jim actually has a. Um, he had a little dental incident and is going to be need to jump off shortly. So um, uh, what I wanted to to do as we kind of wind down here in the last few minutes, uh, Jim, is kind of like, I mean, you, for me, are a real aspiration. Like there's, there's inspiration, I should say. There's um, things that you've said today that have gotten me thinking differently about my life. And that's one of the reasons why I've, I'm glad we're featuring you, but I'm just like curious, like any kind of words of wisdom to other folks that kind of may find themselves in uh, a, a situation where they're either, you know, uh, caregiving for loved ones or trying to reinvent themselves. I, I you know, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I, I really think you've, you've led a very interesting life. Well, thank you. Um, you know, I think the biggest advice would be something my dad taught me is to try to do in life what you would do and enjoy if you weren't getting paid to do it. And I, I mean, everybody that I fly with knows I would fly for free, but they don't take advantage of it. <laughs> During the epidemic, I have a picture of my wife and I standing in front of the little plane that we, the, the family has, that says, we'll fly for toilet paper. So, <laughs> you're gonna go, but um, I, I find caring and, and providing for others' needs and helping them through their situations, very, very gratifying. And I would do it for, for, for nothing. Don't take that to heart, Ben. <laughs> so i actually have a quick question for jim if that's okay yeah no i want to hear more about the humanitarian aid work that you did and the yeah yeah the sure. that. no well, really glad you brought that up he's got so many threads yeah, I'm, I'm Andrea there. is uh yeah the adventist development and relief agency it's it's a huge part of um what I do and and the the mission work. My first mission trip uh, was in 1973. I went to help build a church actually, um, out in uh, Hawaii, believe it or not. And then as a as a young pilot, I started a group, uh, a chapter called Maranatha Flights International at our college, and it's based in uh, Barron Springs. And we took a mission trip to Linares. Mexico, and that's where I actually uh, proposed to Jane. 
Yeah, adra.org is the website. I worked full time there for 15 years and now I still work as an ADRA ambassador. I'm very active with them. Um, I give talks at Rotary clubs and schools. I just gave, I just was part of a group at the mosque up the street where we had uh, folks from the Hindu community and the Buddhist community, a rabbi and myself, and we had uh, prayers for peace in the Middle East. Um, I've had the, the honor and the privilege of, of traveling to over 100 countries uh, doing humanitarian aid, one of our daughter or one of our children, our, we have two boys and a girl, and our daughter actually started Project Propel, which has been active in the Philippines for 12 years. She's lived there for the last 12 years. As a as a youngster, she went to uh, live in Nepal for a year. Um, so they've all got the flying bug, and they've all got the humanitarian aid bug a little bit. Um, and I did that because I mentioned get, joining the church's humanitarian arm and, and taking quite a pay cut back in 92. And then, you know, the, the kids, the kids um, were, were very young at that time. But even so, we our lifestyle was going to have to adjust. One of the things that I did, which turned out to be just very fortuitous. I took them, the whole family, to Buenos Aires, met with the ADRA people, and then we got in an ADRA van and we went 1,600 kilometers to Paraguay and Uruguay and, and throughout down Argentina and over to Brazil. And they came back after seeing how the real world lived and some of the and they just developed a, a passion for for humanity, and um, it just it just it was life changing. And they were like, you know, oh, you go, Dad. It was so they they got it, and um, and Jane got to the point where she appreciated it and enjoyed it so much. After the earthquake in Haiti, she, as a teacher, she had her summer summer off. She went over and worked for the summer. And uh, one summer she was watching Paula Zahn or one of the TV hosts talking about a crisis in Cambodia. And she spent her summer that summer in, in, uh, in Cambodia and uh, yeah. it, with the ADRA team over there. So we just, well, it's just been, it's been a big part, Ben. So thanks for, for asking that. That's a, uh, it's a huge part of our, of our family story. Man, this is really, this has been amazing. And this has been radically different than a lot of the discussions that we've had. But I think using this platform to sort of spotlight this and uh, a, a, just a, a different way of finding purpose and, and helping our, our loved ones, but helping the world. I think uh, you're, you've really given me a lot to think about. And I hope those in the audience today and who are listening to the recording um are inspired as well uh i i i know you gotta got, gotta get to that appointment jim and uh ben i i love this and uh you know i i think i could see this as a regular thing uh where we get at different folks and sort of spotlight their journey and and what they're doing to make the world a better place in relation to us all, you know, moving through the chapters of life. Um, That's a great idea. Yeah, I'd love to be involved with that. Yeah. So, uh, folks, I got, I, I uh, like I said, this is recorded. I'll have it up at proaging.com within the next hour or so. I'll have uh, Jim and Ben's contact info. Feel free to get in touch with them and, uh, find out more about what they're doing or how you can get involved with what they're doing. And, uh, and I would say to anybody in the audience, you know, I mean, Jim, I, I hope you're the first of many because I think that it's great to just sort of spotlight interesting stories like this. This is a great use of all of our time. Well, uh, thank you. And again, I really appreciate your, your hosting Steve and putting all this together. And um, I, I want to, 
for whatever reason, I just feel inspired to share one more little antidote before I run off and get this crown done. <laughs> People sometimes have asked me, because I'm working with the poorest of the poor in, in some of the countries that I work with and in, in the humanitarian aid that I do, to where I'm flying some of the people around on the Fortune 100 list and back and forth and back and forth. And one funny story, I was flying the Bainham brothers uh, the, of the Choice Hotels and, and oh, Man yeah, know them well. Yeah. Dad started that flight operation and taught Stuart Sr. to fly when I was just a little boy. So he, he and I went to school with one of their boys. Um, but we, Dad and I were flying them back from the West Coast one night and they were in the back just playing their version of what would be penny ante poker, I guess. And uh, I had to use the restroom. So walking back from the restroom to the cockpit, um, I just casually said, you know what? You guys are going to win or lose more than it costs to run the hospital for a year in Nepal where my daughter is, because we had just talked to Elizabeth. And they each dug in and gave me $25,000 for that hospital. So we sent $75,000. So sometimes that blending is, it, it works. Sometimes it, it just, when you, when you tell people about the situation, you can use the resources that God's led you to, to help the others. And, and I had a similar experience happen with the family that I'm flying now. I had just come back from South Sudan and I and I gave them they had never heard of the Lost Boys of Sudan or some of the a lot of Americans haven't either, I guess. But anyway, I gave them that um, book. And John Dow is a good friend of mine. And I told him about John Dow and the story. And uh, yeah, I'm not going to disclose the amount, but they, they got a, a nice donation to help out over there. Well, you know, it, it, so it's a good facilitator, I guess. Well, and, and this is another thing you, you sort of dive into another theme that we all need to remember is, is that we have to let people know when we need help. I mean, um, it's hard, you, yeah. you know, but like you were talking about, you, you, hey, this village needs help it is it, if we don't, sh it, but it could be, I need somebody to screw in the light bulb at the, in yeah. my ceiling is don't be afraid to sort of ask for help because there's lots of people out there like Jim and the Bainham family and Ben and me, you know, that want to want to help, but we need to know and you need to be willing to accept help, you know? So um, uh, this is great. All Good. right. Thank you for the opportunity. Yep. I'm going to jump off and. Uh, yep. No, no. I think this is great. Ben. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Ben. Jim. See you all, all right, at bye -bye. the next one. All right.